Okay. Okay. Welcome everybody to our weekly seminar series. This is the last one of um, our um, semester. And uh, we are honored that the semester is uh, concluded with uh, um, Dr. Andrea Plaza Paverola from the University of Tromso in Norway. So um, Andrea is an associate professor at the Department of Geosciences at the University of Tromso, uh, the Arctic University of Norway, and is a researcher which is within CAGE, which is the Center for Arctic Gas Hydrate. Environment and climate. She is the leader of the project Stringless Steam, Steam Stress, sorry, which is tectonic stress effects on Arctic methane seepage. Andrea's main research subjects are seafloor, natural gas seepage, and gas hydrate system, focusing on the geological controls that trigger and sustain seepage, gas chimney morphology, and the evolution of seepage systems over geological time. She holds a PhD degree in 2010 in marine geophysics from the Department of Geosciences in Tromso and a master's degree in petroleum geology from the IFP school in France. Her PhD was centered on the introduction of seismic methods on the study of shallow gas distribution and gas hydrate system on the Norwegian continental margin. She went to New Zealand for a two years postdoc fellowship at GNA Science in Wellington where she investigated fluid flow on gas hydro systems in active subduction marine uh, margin settings. Mm -hmm. And I may say also that uh, we were together on a cruise offshore uh, Svalbard. So that's how I, I know and I had the chance to, to be with the excellent work that Andrea was carrying out. Mm -hmm. So um, today, Andrea is going to talk about a million year uh, fluctuations of the West Svalbard coast stress effects on active methane seepage. So Andrea, the podium is yours. Thank you so much, Nicolas. Uh, long intro. <laughs> and hello, everybody. And uh, I'm so glad to uh, be able of joining you in your, in your seminar there in Israel. Um, so I am, I'm going to talk about um, sort of natural phenomena um, that we know as methane seepage, right? From the sea, from the seabed. You you see here what it is. Uh, you basically see in uh, gas bubbles uh, being released from a crack on the seafloor, and what you see here is a methane derived oxygenic carbonate deposited um, on on that side where a lot of methane gas has been released, and uh, for many thousands if not uh, hundreds of thousands of years. So I, I use flatulence in the title because I think that the metaphor is, is pretty good. There is a constant <laughs> degassing uh, from the earth. And I think I, I stole this from one of the people that, that uh, pioneered the investigations of gas hydrates and I think it was uh, Gwen Bolden. Um, so I'm going to present uh, basically to walk you through uh, one of the case studies in the Arctic where we have a lot of this uh, missing release and where a lot of um, geophysics and geology uh, have been, um, or geophysical and geological studies have uh, been integrated to understand these systems. And I am, um, I have uh, all, some of the work presented here is advanced, corresponds to advances on uh, a relatively recent project, uh, as Nicolas mentioned, stress effects on Arctic methane seepage. So you will see contributions from PhD students, postdocs, and researchers uh, within the project. So <clears throat> the, the talk, we, we start with uh, for some motivation on why to investigate missing uh, seepage phenomena in the Arctic, right? Why is it important? Then we go through some geophysical observations from this particular case study I, I mentioned to you on the West Svalbard margin. And then a, a, a discussion, we finish with a, with a discussion on what are then the potential mechanisms controlling uh, the, the time and the spatial distribution of the release of methane in, in this Arctic region. Um, so I would like to start with this uh, with this slide that actually found this paper yesterday because I wanted to track uh, what, what are the pioneering studies on, on seafloor pockmarks. Pockmarks are this type of 
depressions right on the seafloor where where we know by now that uh, they are formed due to the release of gas and water from the sediment so i found this paper from 79 where they first or started documenting uh, pop marks uh, and this case is from the alaskan uh, shelf the bering shelf in, in alaska you recognize here the peninsula so I put this because I realized that 50 years later, we are actually still on the same, we're still mapping, uh, still looking for, for the same pop marks uh, in new areas. And people are still even publishing in nature this type of, <laughs> of finding. So the, the, the type of research in a way goes slowly because it's difficult to access uh, many regions of shore uh, in the planet, right? So, so there are, there must be thousands of areas uh, where the release of methane from the seafloor is abundant and we don't even know of it. <coughs> Sorry for that. So then uh, I have this uh, map, which I also like. It's a compilation from an oil company from uh, CGG consultancy, but I like it because all the, the green points here in the map indicate where uh, not only gas, but also oil leakage has been uh, mapped or reported. And you can see that there is a lot of it on the continents, but also in uh, yeah, on marine areas. And of course, the deepest part of the oceans is very little uh, mapped on them. And there are probably a lot. There are the deep ocean reach, uh, the mid ocean reach vents that are not included in this map, but this is a widespread phenomenon. So the earth is releasing a lot of energy. And it is important not only from um, sort of energy point of view, but also from a geohazard point of view. Uh, the release of gas means that there are fluids trapped in the sediment, and those fluids make the sediment prone to collapse. And uh, these submarine collapse uh, are known to cause uh, huge uh, tsunamis that have implications for society. There are, of course, the uh, engineering hazards when it comes to um, drilling on gas pockets or gas hydrates, as we will see a bit later. <coughs> Sorry. There is also the implications for seabed ecology. There are a lot of microorganisms and microorganisms that actually depend on that missing. And uh, you go to the deep ocean where there's no light, you do see a lot of uh, ecosystems uh, that survive based on, on the available methane from the seafloor. And there is, of course, the climate implication, because this is an important component of the, of the carbon cycle, right? There is a lot of carbon in the geosphere that is uh, released to the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and that's a circular interaction and, and feedback that we still have not uh, fully quantified. So a lot of research to be done on, on that aspect. So pressure and temperature conditions are, of course, uh, ideal in polar regions to, uh, to sustain uh, what is one of the largest uh, hydro, uh, carbon capacitor on Earth, which is what, what we know as gas hydrates. I don't know for those of you not familiar, this is what, what gas hydrates are, right? So it's uh, frozen gas. Uh, again, uh, occurring in areas where you have low temperatures and uh, high pressures. But in the Arctic, or in, in polar areas, you have also um, the, um, uh, the ice sheets uh, and the low temperatures, permafrost areas when you are on ground that uh, make prone uh, or, or facilitate the accumulation of hydrates, which in turn sort of hold or make an even easier trap for all the methane and all the gases produced in the geosphere. So I found this, this is an article from The Guardian from last year, and uh, they, they report on the first uh, sort of documentation on um, the release of methane from a, an Antarctic region. And um, I, I put it here because this is also one why it is so important to, to study these phenomena in, in polar regions, because there are areas of a slow growth of microbes. And this means that the methane that comes from the seafloor is not quickly um, sort of consumed in the water column, but some of it may be transported faster than what we uh, suspect to the atmosphere. So as you know, I mean, methane is a greenhouse gas, so it is or could be a significant contribution to the uh, global um, atmospheric carbon. 
<clears throat> so back to, to the Arctic margins, um, the, the, in particular, the region around the Svalbard archipelago is extremely interesting because, of course, there was a huge ice sheet covering the whole Svalbard. This is the Varen Sea ice sheet. And when that ice sheet uh, sort of retracted or melted, well, all the gas and all the reservoirs got destabilized, and there was a lot of release of gas in the region. But there is also a uh, release of gas when you go offshore along the continental margin or along the margin, because you enter also oceanic margins. And we see that even closer, let me get the light on. Okay. So even closer to the mid-ocean ridges, uh, there is a lot of methane release. So, so this is a beautiful, beautiful laboratory to investigate all the external mechanisms controlling or sustaining the release of, of that methane. And this is where we are going to be focusing on in this particular case study, which is a deep marine uh, sedimentary uh, ridge. Um, deep marine, I'm talking more than 1,000 meters water depths. And we are going to look a lot at processes related to this uh, methane uh, and gas hydrate system. This is an animation to introduce you to the setting. So again, we are here. This is the Svalbard Mountains here. What you see in black, imagine that this is the water column, uh, more than 1,000 meters. This is the sedimentary ridge where we will be focusing on today. This is the mid-ocean ridge. So you can see how close it is the sedimentary ridge from a mid-ocean ridge. If we look at a seismic profile, this is how this is what we are looking at: some uh, very stratified layers with uh, high amplitude anomalies that indicate the presence of gas trapped very shallow in the sediments uh, within 200 meters uh, from the seafloor. Uh, and this is what we call the bottom simulating reflector, which indicates the base of the hydrostability zone, right? At the seafloor, you see a lot of pockmarks, as you see here, but only or exclusively pockmarks on this part of the sedimentary ridge are leaking gas today, today. So we go with the ship and we see bubbles leaking. The rest of the ridge has pockmarks, but they are not leaking. And the big question is why? What is controlling that? So we started investigating uh, using uh, some modeling of, of uh, stresses, and we find that, uh, or preliminary, that uh, the tectonic stress from the mid-ocean ridge may have an effect, meaning that uh, part of the margin is under a strike slip regime here indicated by green dots, and part of the margin is under a tensile stress regime, meaning that you have more opening, more fault uh, and cracks that are leaking the gas. And this is where we are uh, going into in more detail at the moment. So we are back to this uh, image to emphasize the big question or the most exciting question here. We have a sedimentary ridge. It's about 100 kilometers. You can imagine that you are from here, east, uh, the right part of the image to the west, you have 100 kilometers. And again, this um, sort of bright colors here indicate that you do have gas along all that sediment ridge and you have faults. You have pockmarks. This is the bathymetry. So you have pockmarks at the seafloor, but you have release of gas of only these structures here. And the question is what controls that? So there has been a lot of uh, integrated geophysical and geological studies uh, to look into this, chronostratigraphy, oxygenic carbonate, proxies, seismics, basin modeling, stress field modeling, seismic velocity. So, and I'm gonna just so you, um, sort of discuss with you uh, some highlights uh, or, or studies that have advanced knowledge on the system. So the first thing to, to point out is that when people have measured the composition of gas, both on hydrates or in the in the sort of the fluids content uh, in the in the sediment courts, it is um, evident that there is a lot of thermogenic gas that you see here expressed. You have depth here, and you have here the relationship between C one, which is methane. And uh, C2 and C3, this is uh, ethane and propane, right? So when this relationship is low, 
like I have here a lot of points for the Vesnesa Ridge, which is the, the sedimentary ridge we are focusing on today. Um, there is a lot of uh, ethane and propane and other heavier hydrocarbons indicating that the methane is produced uh, thermogenic in deeper reservoirs. And when you have a, a higher rate, uh, like in these curves here from ODP sites, then you can see that microbial production of methane dominates, meaning that uh, it's a process that can be happening very close to the seafloor simply by microbes uh, consuming uh, the organic matter in the sediments, right? So, and I must say that uh, in this particular margin in the Arctic, we also see places where there may be non-organic as uh, abiogenic gas, meaning that the gas is not produced uh, by consumption of organic matter, but due to chemical reactions uh, in the mantle and, you know, transform, trans, uh, migrated upward um, into the crust. So when we look at the um, sort of the basing model of this system, again, we have a seismic profile, mid-ocean ridge here, or a transform fault, and then the sedimentary Vesnesa ridge here. And the, the basing modeling shows that gas in this system, or the thermogenic gas, has started to be produced about six millions of years ago, and only three million years ago, that gas started to sort of migrate, right, by buoyancy into the shallower strata. So this is a relatively recent uh, thermogenic system that has been leaking presumably already for uh, 3 million years. And if this uh, basic modeling uh, sort of is extended into 3D and, and, and becomes more complex, then there can be predicted where the gas traps uh, occur, right? And the model predicts that indeed there are traps very shallow. If you see here, I mean, we, we are we are talking about uh, um, 100, 200 meters, okay, from the seafloor. And what you see here as Lomi and Lunda are the seafloor poke marks where there is a lot of gas being released today. And the model predicts some uh, gas traps uh, in the vicinity of those leaking spots, right, at the seafloor. You see in red are the, the gas traps. In yellow, you have um, sort of migration intensity deeper in the reservoirs. So now what we are gonna do is we, we start zooming into the um, sort of the shallow system and look into high resolution data and how does it look, the upper 200 meters of sediments where that gas leaks through and where we presumably or we do have a gas hydrate system also. So when we look into, into the system, what, what you see here now, it's a, it's a structural map produced using high resolution 3D seismic data. So you get your 3D seismic volume and you calculate the variance among the seismic traces. I, I have absolutely no idea of your background in seismics, but uh, I'm gonna be general here. It's basically a map to indicate where are uh, faults, fractures. You can see all these are faults in the sediment, small scale fractures. And what you see in blue here is um, an extraction of how what we call a gas chimney looks like. So gas chimney is vertically a ver basically a vertical conduit where the gas um, yeah, was overpressured and, and cracked the sediment and got released into the yeah, towards the seafloor. So you see that gas chimneys are restricted to some of the structures, but that they are uh, related to faults and fractures, okay? So the release of gas in this particular margin is closely related to faulting and fracturing. Um, so you see, uh, yeah, there are different uh, sort of structures and type of features, some positive, some more uh, collapsed features. And then what you see here uh, is uh, high um, RMS amplitudes, meaning that there is uh, gas, there are shallow gas pockets in the system, right, sustaining the release. When you zoom out a bit, again, we are on the sedimentary ridge. This is a bathymetry map of the 100 kilometer sedimentary ridge. And this is the area where we observe active gas release. And this is the area where the pogmars are not leaking gas nowadays. And you can see that when we do a variance map, again, a structural analysis using seismic 
um, we see different orientation of structures. So here, this part of the ridge, you have structures that are almost northwest, southeast. While if you go to this corner of the ridge, you see structures that are a little bit more north, north south, and then even changing to northeast, southwest orientations. So there is something very interesting about this ridge because there is a spatial variation in the type of structures that we encounter. It's not that the whole ridge is folded in the same way. So uh, this is what makes us, make us think that the way the regional stress is affecting this sedimentary ridge has a strong control on uh, how much and where the gas is being released. This is a very interesting study here. This is um, a former PhD student who looked into the seismic velocities from ocean bottom seismometers, right? So we put a seismometer on the ground and then you shoot the seismic in circles and then you can uh, record the energy that travels uh, in azimuths, right? With different angles. And by doing that, you can uh, sort of see whether the energy gets uh, speed up or, or gets or slows down the speed, right? And uh, in these particular areas, we are back to the to the structural maps you saw before. You can see that the sort of the yellow zones here, which corresponds to slightly uh, larger seismic velocities, corresponds to the the faults of fracture zones. And this is interesting because uh, we, we interpret this as the faults and the cracks may be plugged with gas hydrates or carbonates. I mean, gas hydrates is um, sort of more natural to think because these are within the gas hydrate stability zone. And it is well no known that if you have a lot of uh, porous space and the right temperature and pressure conditions, you will form this frozen gas or the hydrates. But when gas is released, uh, there is a lot of autogenic carbonate associated to that methane that also precipitates. So that's why I add here or carbonate, right? And interestingly, um, then we go to, to this nice study by those who study the cores. Um, they have found this uh, methane uh, derived autogenic carbonate, which this is how it looks like in a core. And when they date them, they can tell um, because once they find this type of carbonate in a sediment core, they immediately relate it to a methane event. Okay, this means that there was methane being released to the seafloor at that particular time, as you saw in the first slide when we started, uh, when Nicolas was introducing us. So um, the, the presence of this autogenic carbonate provides a way of dating key seepage release events or missing release events. Uh, and then something very interesting because these carbonates that I'm showing you here from this particular study are from a deep core that had more than 20 meters depth. We could correlate with our seismic data. And interestingly, the presence of those carbonates layers correlate with this type of anomaly in the seismic, which we had in the past, uh, some years ago, suggested that they could be buried autogenic carbonate concretion. So this is a way of ground truth in that um, the release of methane leave a footprint that we can identify uh, in seismic data. And this is what we have done. Now we can extrapolate. If we look now at uh, extensive uh, data sets and we find those high amplitude anomalies and we bring in chronostratigraphic uh, constraints, then we can reconstruct the seepage history. We can say, well, there has been major seepage events around 130,000, and there was another major seepage event around 330,000 years ago, right? And, and this means that um, basically what we observe based on geophysical and also on geological data is that the seepage or the release of the methane is episodic and the periodicity of that process varies. When you have the people working with sediments, they plot all those inferred seepage events and they can see, at least as you see here in time, for the last 160,000 years, uh, you see those po points are major seepage events. 
and some of them plot right after a sort of a glacial maximum. So it has been uh, suggested that the glacial dynamics, the transition from a maximum glaciation period to a deglaciation period to a um, interglacial sort of has an effect on seepage dynamics. And most likely uh, what, what causes or what triggers most of the release is right after a maximum uh, glacial maximum. At least that's what this particular um, PD or field data suggest. So what are all the uh, controls or the physical processes determining when and, and where the gas is released? So we have been investigating or we see that tectonic stress has an effect, glacial stress, sedimentation and erosion rates, and of course, reservoir overpressure due to thermogenic gas leaking and even sea level changes. And this is what I'm gonna show you briefly uh, or we are gonna discuss some of these uh, briefly. So first, as mentioned, we did a preliminary um, modeling exercise where um, the, this is the mid-ocean ridge, mid-ocean ridge here, and this is, a sediment, this is a sedimentary ridge we are looking at. In yellow are points where we see gas release at present, and in white are pockmarks where there's no present day gas release, but we know that there has been release in the past. And when we overlap the tectonic modeling, uh, meaning the type of stress generated by this ocean spreading, so by the opening of this mid-ocean ridge and this mid-ocean ridge in those directions, uh, we notice that in blue here, it's a tensile stress regime. And in green is a strike slip stress regime. And notice that maybe coincidentally, but interest, it's a very interesting coincidence in any case, most of the present day active seepage is within or close by a tensile stress regime. And this is very uh, nice if, if it is like that, but it's intuitive in the sense that in a tensile stress regimes, well, there are faults and cracks that are basically opening. So all the gas in the reservoirs is nicely uh, being released through those faults. While um, these other parts of the margin, although there are gas, although there is gas trapped near the seafloor, the system is more closed, the faults the structures are closed and the, there's no pathway for gas. But this model doesn't explain then why there was leakage in the past in the rest of the sedimentary ridge. And um, we suggest that, uh, or we think that one answer could be related to the glacial stress, right? So uh, as you know, this is, uh, I mean, this is Greenland in this map. So you have a huge ice sheet there and this is Valvar. And there was in the past a huge ice sheet there, right? Until the last glacial maximum. And right now it's just uh, some glaciers on the island. And all this is a Varren Sea, which is free of, of that ice sheet. And this is the Fram Strait, which is, which is also uh, free from that ice sheet uh, nowadays. But what happened if we model um, the stresses uh, cost on the crust, on the lithosphere, when you had that heavy uh, ice sheet on the on the Svalbard region, well, this is what this postdoc is uh, currently working on, and um, this is uh, the type of uh, maximum horizontal stress created by the weight of the ice uh, during the last glaciation, and this is for present day, right? Um, just after removing the ice uh, sheet from Svalbard, and you see that, I mean, in, in red is a very high compressive, compressive stresses and in blue is more towards a tensile stress regime. So there has been a change uh, from more compressive to uh, more tensile. It's an evolution of that stress field in the Fram Strait, uh, Fram Strait region where we observe um, sort of a spatial variation of the, of the methane release. So we are now currently exploring whether um, the glacial stresses have an influence on the amount of cracks and faults uh, that are forming in this region due to the forebulge, due to the weight of the, of the, of the ice, 
or due to other physical processes. Um, and this is uh, sort of a schematic uh, to, to explain that, but overall we observe that seepage periodicity is largely controlled by fault kinematics in response to either um, tectonic from the mid-ocean ridge or from the glacial from the glacial system, right? And here we have two two conceptual models. The first one is when the faults are being created. So you have an, an ice sheet on this valvar region, right? We are back in time. And then that weight create a bend in the crust. And then this is what is called the four bulge on the crust due to the ice. And then this area is prone to, to a stretch. So to faulting, to normal faulting, to deletion of faults and fra tensile fracturing. So, if you create those faults, of course, at that time, and you had some gas accumulated, well, you would nicely promote the release of that gas. And at present day, what may be happening is that you already have a lot of faults in place, but there is still a little bit of rebound and adjustment, right? From there is a, a, the crustal adjustment or the rebound uh, following still the, uh, ice, the ice retreat and only uh, small pressure perturbations in such system would be enough to promote uh, the, the release of gas that is accumulated in, in shallow reservoirs. And we think that this is where we are uh, when we observe present day seepage, right? In the eastern part of the ridge. And interestingly, we also think that uh, this type of small pressure perturbations can be caused also by simple changes in the water column. And I guess some of you have heard that in other parts of the world, seepage has been correlated with the tide, tidal cycles uh, because actually the weight of the water column uh, have a significant impact on the near surface. And whatever gas accumulation there is prone to, uh, it's very sensible uh, to um, uh, small changes in pressure. And a little bit like a few meters of changes in the water column would be enough to uh, sort of perturb the pressure regime that delayed these shallow uh, cracks. We are talking now about two, five meters, okay, from the seafloor and release uh, whatever gas uh, that is accumulated there. And this is a conceptual model from a recent paper um, that um, we, um, I mean, from a study where we use piezometers from Ifremer in France. They have this nice instrument that you push uh, a rod with uh, temperature and pressure sensors, the seven meters uh, tool, and you can measure temperature and pressure over, in this case, four days, right? And what you see here is a temperature result. What you see here is time after we put the instrument in the ground, so about 70 hours of recording, and you see here pressure. And we interestingly see that there are peaks of, in particular, pressure in some of the sensors. I mean, the gray one here is the deepest sensor. Uh, sorry, the, the gray is the shallowest sensor brown is the deepest sensor. So in the shallowest sensors, there are a lot of peaks in pressure. And when we um, sort of correlate this data with um, tidal models, we can see a certain correlation uh, between the pressure generated by an increase or a decrease of the tides and the pressure pulse. That was uh, very interesting to see, but we observe this only on one on one particular site. So I think we were very lucky that we hit a sort of very shallow gas pocket that you know, was able of expressing that influence from the tides because that's not easy to see in, in other areas. Uh, such a relationship between the release of gas and um, sort of um, small perturbations of pressures can be also seen using, um, I mean, looking at the seismological data, the passive signals recorded by ocean bottom seismometers. So we have another PhD student looking at OBS data, as, as mentioned, bottom seismometers. And he sees, uh, um, in addition to PNS uh, wave that are 
characteristics of earthquakes. He sees what what they are what what is called among the the community now short duration events, and they look like this. They are very short signals um, that come in in a lot of uh, pulses suddenly, and they also show some periodicity. So when he compares with the same sort of model tides uh, in the region, there seem to be a correlation between peaks of uh, short duration events and high tides and also low tides. So it's actually not necessarily correlated only with the sort of, uh, with the uh, low tides, but also with high tides. So we are still looking into what is physically what is happening uh, here in this correlation. Here you see the how the short duration event looks like. This is how you see it in a in a seismogram when you collect your instrument from the seafloor. And what you see here is one of these pock marks where gas is being is released uh, from these small uh, pits in the pogmar. And then the anomalies that we saw before that are presumably these autogenic carbonate buried structures. And then what you see here is a correlation plot uh, where basically it is telling us that if you look at short duration events every month, we record it for a year, okay? If you look at every month, you do see a certain correlation between the short duration events and the high and low tides. So when we look, uh, we put the whole margin into one profile. You see here, this is a mid-ocean ridge, and this is a sedimentary ridge we have been talking about. And here is it will be the shelf break, right? And Svalbard would be here. So again, a zone that is leaking the gas, uh, another zone that has a lot of gas trapped underneath the base of the hydrostability zone, but it's do not leaking any gas. And, and then we put some piezometer data again, uh, this instrument to measure pressure. And we do see, I mean, we put one here, one here, we put stations along the margin. And we do see that there is a sort of landward increase in the pressure uh, regime there within the upper 10 meters of sediments. And now we are suspecting that there is an expression of uh, sort of compression of those sediments towards the continent is being sort of transferred or expressed in the in the near surface. And this is kind of debatable because man, usually we think that the stress uh, stays deeper in the crust and you don't you do not see a lot of horizontal stress uh, uh, differences in the in the near surface because the weight of the sediment dominates. But we think that we are discovering some differences, maybe also partly controlled by the lithology. Okay, changes in the lithology and the amount of clay in the sediments along the margin, and we are looking into that at the moment. But certainly sedimentation rates and erosion rates have also an influence on the pressure field that control the gas release. And another PhD student is looking into, again, 3D seismic data, and she sees a lot of small scale uh, features, like the ones you see in these maps. And we think that these are, uh, this is expression of dewatering and degassing at specific periods of time presumably related to uh, increases in sedimentation rates. So to uh, wrap up here, we put all these uh, modeling uh, and uh, field observations into a conceptual model. And uh, we think that uh, we do have a, a basically a gas hydrate stability zone. As you have here at the seafloor, you have a gas column underneath. And that gas, and, and well, and you have faults and fractures, okay, in the system, but the combination between sufficient gas in that gas column and uh, a good pressure and stress regime is what controls that those structures open up or close for the release of gas along this sedimentary uh, margin. So we are now sort of um, simulating all these physical processes to understand them from a you know, conceptual point of view and also to get some numbers. So preliminary results show that gas flux through uh, an open set of fractures in this system would take about 64 days. So it's a quick 
release of gas. So if it's going for many thousands of years, it means that you do have a lot of gas leaking from a thermogenic reservoir. And as comparison, you, you can have release of gas through other processes like advective or diffusive, uh, and that would take uh, tens of thousands of years. So to summarize, seafloor seepage phenomena in the Arctic has been occurring for millions of years. Uh, some of this missing is likely to reach the atmosphere, it still needs to be quantified. Integrated geophysical and geological interpretation reveals that uh, the release of missing is episodic with some events correlating with the glacial terminations, but the observation of uh, chimneys and, and fluid flow features uh, uh, together with faults and fractures uh, suggests that the release of the gas is closely uh, interconnected to, to fault kinematics. And um, even tides and uh, small changes in pressure may have a control on uh, the periodicity uh, and the type of, of gas release when we talk about fracture sediments uh, near the seafloor. And as a final uh, sort of take home uh, message, I would like to say that near surface sediments uh, do contain one of the largest carbon capacitors on Earth, so a lot of gas hydrates, and any pressure and temperature perturbation uh, would have an impact on the amount of carbon that is released uh, on a historical uh, yeah, sort of um, geological time. And obviously, polar regions are particularly susceptible to, to such perturbations. So they are a great laboratory to investigate uh, these systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this fantastic talk. I really enjoyed uh, much part of it, a lot of it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm opening the, the podium for questions from the audience. May I? May I ask a question? Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, please. Hey, I'm Regina Katzman. Um, somehow I can't see the participants, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, I have just maybe not questions, but um, two comments. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding the effect of the uh, ice load, for instance, or even a hydrostatic load, I completely agree that, for instance, the tidal effect or any in decrease in the load can induce the gas release, okay? But in contrast, actually, with respect to the seismicity, the actually the induced seismicity, which, to my understanding is connected to both the load and the, the pore pressure changes, which means that the fluid um, uh, transport to the hypocentral depths, uh, this, the, the, this pore pressure uh, increase, for instance, it occurs at much larger time scale than the tidal time scale. So to me, if you connect this seismicity, uh, even the micro seismicity to the tidal cycle, uh, it seems to me that this time scale is not sufficient to induce this seismicity because actually for the seismicity, the scale of uh, like years or even more is sufficient to induce the seismicity. Absolutely. This just yeah. No, that, this is a this is a great comment, and I think I, I am totally agree with you. And I think we are talking about. I should have specified. So we are definitely not talking about sort of small earthquakes. We're talking about this is a this short duration events. They don't even look like an earthquake. It's some sort of um, sort of a P wave, uh, or it's actually very unclear what type of it is. But it's a very small um, sort of perturbation uh, that because of the timing, this, the community knows that they have to be coming from a very localized source and very shallow source or very close to the instrument, right? It really comes quick and, and short and, and, and lasts very short. So it's not really a standard sort of micro earthquake, which I totally agree with you, will be hard to link to this type of system. But 
more some sort of vibration. I think the, the direction here, which again is, is still a research, uh, a research topic is vibrations with the, with the gas, you know, the bubbles passing through uh, these um, uh, cracks on the upper two meters of sediment. The, so the cracks dilating and closing, dilating and closing and creating some sort of uh, vibration. This is uh, sort of the, the current hypothesis, but it's certainly not, uh, I agree with you, um, related to micro seismicity or, or micro earthquakes. Let's uh, use the right, uh, right word. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Somebody has uh, more questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for your uh, professional presentation. I, I have some uh, question about the, that you mentioned in the West uh, Western Air Ridge and the Eastern Western Air Ridge. Uh -huh. and there is the leakage in the Eastern Western Air Ridge, right? And right. It's because of the different thickness of the sediment. Well, this is this is exactly what we are uh, digging into. You see, look at this seismic here. I don't know if you have a, have a ground on, on your physics, but the, the sediment is not so different, actually. We do have a uh, contourite. This is a contourite. These are sediments deposited by bottom currents, and they are very homogeneous, uh, except for the upper uh, layers, if you go towards the land, because you have a lot of glacial debris. So you have a little bit of changes on the upper, actually no intercalations of more glacial debris, but overall, the whole sedimentary ridge is the same, uh, sort of is the same contourite ridge. So what exactly is uh, controlling that the seepage on this part of the ridge stop? We think that it has to do more with the mechanics of the system. So you do have faults that are either closed or the gas is not there as we suspect because it has migrated somewhere else. You see, we think that there is a more uh, physical uh, control on, on, on that. Maybe there is a larger thermogenic reservoir on this site, on the eastern side of the ridge um, and overpressure is maintaining the faults open, for example. Oh, okay. I had a and another and a second question. How? Uh, I, sorry, I missed it because you speak a little bit fast. Yes, sorry. <laughs> how how does the sea sea level uh, changes influence uh, the liquid because of the pressure? The different. Yeah. So so it, it goes to to pressure, right? But the the interesting question is, is it is it as straightforward as if you reduce the water column? So low ties, you are reducing the pressure and then the sort of the pressure of the reservoir can uh, sort of gain over, over the hydrostatic pressure or there are more complex processes uh, implying, you know, cracking of the sediment and also on the sort of um, thermal behavior of gas hydrates because it's a very complex system, right? You, you do have free gas, but you also have gas that is dissolving water and that becomes hydrates. <laughs> so, so you have that cycle there. So what happened when you reduce the, the, the height of the water column? Yes, you are reducing the pressure and less pressure may mean that you have more gas ex in ex ex solution, okay, from the dissolved uh, phase. But what happened with the, with the free gas? Is the free gas still moving faster or you are giving more gas to the gas hydrate? It's actually, uh, a little bit complex, uh, what exactly is the pressure doing? But some of the hypotheses that you, you can see it in different papers around the world is that you reduce the water column and basically you, you have more gas that is being exolved from the pore water, if you see what I mean, because it's easier for the gas to get out of, of, um, of solution. And then you have more, more bubbles leaking. So that's a, the straightforward line of thinking. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I can go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I mean, you partly answered my one of my questions from uh, what Lee asked, but uh, I was actually uh, looking at some of the slides you presented and uh, the controlling factors for the gases that are released. If it is not a uh, 
solid tectonic or the sedimentary uh, uh, accumulation of this, that is the thickness of the sediment. Are there any uh, major fault that we can point to? Because uh, from one of the slides you released that is uh, close to the ridge, you, you pointed that the gases are not actually being released where they are accumulated. So are there major fault that you can actually uh, look at to see from some of your seismic section? Yeah. That maybe they are controlling this because uh, the influence of the ice glacier conclusion you make is yeah. something different as well. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, this. There are two things that we we do see actually. We in this figure that I have here uh, projected. All these black lines are sedimentary faults. Okay, so they are very small scale or small scale. We're talking about the upper okay. four hundred meters of sediments. And you, when you look at your three D seismic, you do see those faults. Let me see. I have the variance maps here. Uh, yeah, this I saw one variance map. Okay. So, so this actually, these are faults. Uh, these uh, stru linear structures, when you look at your seismic, you, you notice that they are faults. They are going deeper into the setting. But these are sedimentary faults, and they are relatively small to faults that you see when you look deeper into the crust. Uh, something I, I didn't mention is that this sedimentary ridge is deposited over oceanic crust. That's amazing, actually. Let me see if I, one of the... This figure here showed you a little bit. So here, what you see here. Yes, exactly. All this mm -hmm. is oceanic crust. So, and this is a mid-ocean ridge here. So you do have really long detachment faults on the oceanic crust. And on top of it, you deposit a lot of sediments making this thick sedimentary ridge and some sedimentary faults continuing from the detachment faults. That is quite fascinating. So yes, I agree with you. The, another uh, interesting problem would be to see where are the major faults on the crust that are uh, allowing to fill in the gas hydrate system. But look at the seismic again. There are, or at least this is what we interpret from seismic, that we have a lot of gas actually. Uh, also in this part of the area. So already a lot of gas migrated to shallow areas, okay? It's already there, but it hasn't been released or it's not being released as sustained as in the other part. Okay, but one more thing, but were you able to, to uh, envisage if the gas are uh, traveling to this point where immediately after the, the glacial uh, maximum, that's after the glacial maximum? Because this is another thing to look <laughs> to consider. Yeah, so that I don't think we can reconstruct, can we? But I guess, I mean, as the basic modeling shows, um, gas theoretically, thermogenic mm -hmm. gas started to be produced six million years ago, and it started to have the right pressure to migrate three million years ago. Okay, so um, yeah, so you were filling with thermogenic gas from three million years ago, but on the, if you go to the last glacial maximum, there was a lot of pressure and those faults may have behaved differently and those faults may have opened more or less compared to what they are today. So that's something we are looking into through modeling. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very to much. You. <laughs> thank you very much. Somebody else had a question? Well, until... The question arrives. I have a question. <clears throat> you showed over there um, um, in one of the slides uh, dates done on the carbonates that precipitates. Yeah, uh, this one. Nice. Yeah, that one. That one. I just wonder. Um, first of all, what type of um, ah, uranium-thorium, right? And are you sure this is an open, closed system and not open system? Just a question about. Um, about that. Yeah, so you, you mean if it's a uh, closed city, I, we think that it's, uh, you, you mean open system in terms of uh, still like, receiving gas? And yeah, then... sometimes sometimes a carbonate can be recrystallized and um, and then basically the, uh, the uranium will be not, the uranium that is measured for the uranium-thorium ages 
will not be the original one, but rather um, cooperated later on. So maybe- Yeah, okay. You are on a technical geochemistry question that yeah, I, I, I'm not able of answering you. Of no, you okay. would need to ask, uh, you know, our colleagues uh, yeah. working with the proxies. Yeah, yeah, Tobias no and- uh, no or your or some of your colleagues, uh, former colleagues from Bergen. <laughs> <laughs> no uh, but but I can tell you, I mean that I mean what I know from this, which is the part that I can relate to the seismics because that's my background, is that this um, methane derived autogenic carbonates. Uh, remember, this is not a normal carbonate uh, precipitation. It's a methane derived autogenic carbonate with some special oxygen conditions, and when uh, you have this or they have this, they can date with, of course, some uh, age error, but pretty uh, uh, close or pretty uh, thoroughly tell more or less when you did have a major missing seepage event. So this is a, the, the interesting thing of this process, of course, with some errors for sure. And then the technicalities of, yeah. Yeah, no, which but is that error. The data is fantastic, yeah, mm -hmm. it's amazing, really. We are attempting also to date carbonates offshore Israel as well for yeah. some seepage that we have here in the Levant. Nice, so if you found seepage, that's a brilliant way to all what you can do with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, more questions from the audience? I would like to ask a question or two. Comment. Go ahead. I was expecting I, you earlier to ask the yes, question. Yes, well, I, I, you know, I, you, you have to let other people talk as well. And I had the children. <laughs> I had, I had been preparing lunch. I'm sorry, I had to prepare lunch while the, the talk is on. You know, these times are kind of strange. Yeah. Uh, things are not simple. So, uh, first of all, Andrea, hi. Thank you very much for a great talk. It was a fantastic talk. Overwhelming. <laughs> uh, so many things. So many nice things. And, uh, and the question maybe I leave to the end is what's the fate of cage? <laughs> but, uh, um, some, some technical question is, uh, how, do you, how do you distinguish? It's always a challenge for me when I look at these data from uh, seepage areas. It always looks like it's coming vertical, right? And, and there is always the challenge, how do you really uh, tell where it's coming from? Is it, is it really coming vertical or is it just a uh, downwash of something that actually happened at a shallower level and could have been fed uh, horizontally, laterally? Uh, and that always puzzles me really as a challenge. Yeah, but a very nice question. And, and I, I think you have always have both, in particular when it's a system where you have thermogenic gas involved. So uh, I, I do think, I mean, we know there is vertical because when you look at the 3D seismic, you can map the vertical, literally a vertical conduit where all the sediment has been brecciated and you know that the gas has leaked through. But that doesn't mean that I mean you, that you did not have lateral migration of gas towards a structurally preferred area, right? And I think this is the case here. You do have a sedimentary ridge, so you do have a crest. Let's go to the right figure here. So here, for example, this is a basimetry, so recognize that you have a crest here. So when you look at all the seismic at a regional scale, you do see lateral migration of the gas towards the crest of the ridge. But the interesting thing is that once it arrived on the crest, well, something happened and the gas gets some sort of focused, it, it accumulates in, in focused areas where the pressure increases and that's where it sort of generates overpressure and breaks the, the sediment vertically. So it must be a very strong, uh, a strong system. And, and I think that is a strong, but also there are weakness zones. And, and this is why, um, I argue so strongly that, that uh, the stress and the regional forcing and the type of faults you have are controlling uh, exactly where you form these chimneys. Right? Yes, they, they help the pressure. I agree. We have something very similar. Yeah. We're just working with uh, Lawal. I don't see him uh, on, on a paper exactly on an example like that where you have weakness 
witness yeah. lines, in falls, in falls, and and they tunnel yeah. uh, multiple, multiple yeah. flow. But uh, really, uh, it's really. I, I think that sometime uh, we need maybe to sit together, the community, and sort of phrase a criteria or something yeah. that uh, people can uh, can can lean on when they are actually arguing for vertical versus horizontal uh, Slow uh, because this is really you know sometimes it looks like a chimney all the way down but it's not a chimney it's just a data it's just a data artifact okay right? now you're talking about the, the origin yes, yeah yes, that's, the whole thing that's maybe a, a data yeah, artifact yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always okay. it may be a data artifact, can't it? Yeah, well, well you, we, the thing, the interesting thing is when, if you have the opportunity to link uh, various resolution of seismic data, that's that's cool because then you see sometimes that you have a fault and then you can see where the more vertical deformation starts. And, and maybe your highest resolution doesn't tell you. And as you say, you have some masking and you cannot tell what's the base, uh, where is the focus point to start that chimney. That's true. But I think there are some good data around uh, showing the sort of the full picture. I, I remember some from my PhD. You can look for mid Norwegian margin. That they were very good uh, sort of multi-channel seismic together with the high resolution P cable 3D seismic. And that combination would show you, oh, wow, indeed, you do have a fault. And then this vertical perturbation starts more or less here. And you can, but you cannot solve that for every system. I totally agree. So. Yeah. Well, we do have some of that uh, kind of uh, combinations. We have these kinds of combinations of our own. We, we over the last decade we have uh, seen here you haven't been to gyms have you we've seen here lots of uh, not this year i have been there no no the, the previous the 14 when we added in haifa ah uh, no i missed that one yeah, yeah yes yeah. Uh, so uh, we we do have quite a lot of gas now that we have that we are familiar with and we are different uh, um so uh, I'm, I'm aiming at that question because maybe the the answer to the puzzle about east and west may be that there is some uh, lateral motion between the east and west, but it's, it's just throwing an idea to the wind because uh, for that you need to really look in more detail in the in yeah. the work and and yeah. there is lots of work that you guys have been doing. It's quite amazing. Um, so you, tell me, yeah, what about cage? What what is going on with cage so cage finish next year isn't it um february is one year to go and one then, year to go and then yeah. what well then maybe the next center <laughs> Still. Are, are you are you seeing a horizon for a continued activity or a, for real continued activity of this uh, because this was a, a leading globally leading activity in this in yeah. this topic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's shifting. It's not going to be gas hydrates, but more general, like the way I presented it today, more the carbon cycle, right? Uh, it's beyond. Ah, yes. It's beyond. Cycle. It's beyond gas hydrates. Think about it. It's a huge carbon capacitor, right? So, that's an interesting question now. Yes, and we, so, we, so much uh, that so slow we're going. I mean, think about it. Fifty years, we're still mapping pockmarks. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been we've been uh, shifting a little bit to doing a uh, marine protected area management and uh, and designation and things like that, going more into the environmental world, even further into the environmental world using yeah. all these. Uh, it's moving to that direction. It's moving uh, more and more to that direction, obviously. And, so that's the, also yeah. the fate of cage you're saying yeah sure there are there are groups that are even more yeah developing more the environmental part of it yeah and what about the c c like a sequestration and storage and things CCS, like that yes yeah so we have a, a stefan our colleague i don't know he's uh, the one uh, stefan, here yes, I know stefan, stefan boon so he's he's leading that topic he's super interested in the topic and using big cable you know this uh, 3d seismic we have here uh, or we use uh, yeah. to use it for that uh, application for ccs for mapping the you know the seal uh, integrity uh, yeah high detail uh, reservoir and, and uh, fluid migration mapping 
uh, with that application. I think Stefan has a PhD student looking into that as well. But it's, you know, it's a group. I'm, I'm also part of Stefan group, but that's sort of a group. It's not the center. Going yeah, it's in, not the center. But, but what's no. going on to happen with the center? Is it? So, well, some of the perf of the stuff that are permanent stays here and maybe continue with the next center. Some postdocs, you know, start finding other positions and researchers also uh, probably most of, or some of the researchers or the young researchers have to start applying somewhere else. Because we are looking for some students in the postdocs. Yeah, well, we have several uh, funded projects that uh, are very interesting. interesting with the, well, that's the, very interesting to know in particular postdocs, right? If you have PhD students finishing here, can contact you guys and uh, definitely you know, uh, every, every have, time you have uh, just circulate to us, Nicolas, also these uh, advertisements and uh, no problem. And as much as I found this conversation interesting, but I think this goes to more uh, other subjects, and I would absolutely. Close we are deep into the second hour so um it's a feel free to contact andrea i mean um i can i mean she can send you the contact details right yes. absolutely and i will send you advertisement you. for norway absolutely no problem so uh with it words i thank you everybody and extremely thank you andrea Muchísimas thanks to gracias. you guys yeah okay. <laughs> and uh, we will see each other in after the break and Andrea would you like to remain in touch with us for the next seminars just to receive them absolutely maybe you will find something interesting and you would like to join absolutely keep me in the loop <laughs> thank you very much okay. thank you so much nice to meet Have you, you. Great, bye bye great bye bye, -bye.